Well, in order to uh, to get through what we need to get through, I think we're going to have to get started, and then people can just catch up as we go along. Uh, but tonight's topic is the birth of Pecusa, P-E-C-U-S-A. That was the title that the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America adopted just after the revolution, before they had the structures and the characters that we're going to talk about tonight. But they adopted that as their title. And that was the title of the church all the way up until the latest prayer book when they dropped the Protestants. <laughs> so now it is Akusa, the Episcopal Church in the United States of America. And it's not Protestant anymore. It's not Protestant anymore. <laughs> it's both. So we're going to talk, and it's going to be a really sort of dramatic story that we're going to tell here. Uh, and it's going to take place, of course, the setting is Philadelphia, which was an English-speaking city, probably one of the second largest English-speaking cities in the world at that time. It was a vibrant community. And of course, because of the good work of William Penn, it had a variety of religious places of worship and faith and knowledge. Um, the, as far as our church is concerned, here is a map of Philadelphia. Uh, and this is Market Street, where Ben Franklin was and all that. And then the first church, which we'll look at in a little more detail, was Christ Church, which was founded in 1695. And it was here. This area along the river is known as Society Hill. There's a slight rise in the terrain there. It's called Society Hill, not because of high society, uh, but because of the Society of Free Traders, which was like a union or an organization at that time. And they began to build a lot of houses along that way. Well, these people over here uh, did not like to walk in the muddy streets to get to Christ Church. So they petitioned to build their own church which we'll look at in a little more detail in 1761 around here on Pine Street and 3rd. Why didn't they pave the road? <laughs> <laughs> so here is Christ Church, uh, founded in 1695. It is a beautiful structure, as you can see on the inside. And this is going to be uh, the setting for a lot of one channel of our story. Um, and then, of course, we have St. Peter's Church, which was the church which was built in Society Hill in 1761. And the people um, who were in Society Hill, uh, they wanted their own church. Uh, William Penn's descendants uh, granted them the land. Everybody thought it was a good idea. But they had to petition the vestry and rector of Christ Church to see if they could create their own parish and build a church. And the rector of Christ Church, of course, didn't want to divide his congregation or split his assets. And so he basically said, okay, you can build a church, but they will be the united parishes of Christ Church and St. Peter's with one rector and one vestry, and we'll get a couple of assistants. And when the assistant is preaching in St. Peter's, I'll be preaching in Christ Church, and then we'll switch. So they became the united parishes. Now, St. Peter's, I'm going to just give you, this is not necessarily completely germane to our task, uh, but I love this church. Uh, this is the interior of St. Peter's. It was built by an uh, architect named Robert Smith, who you might know also built a place called Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia, a very famous building. Uh, he built a number of churches in the Philadelphia area. One of the challenges that faced Robert Smith was that during this particular period of Anglican worship, the sermon was the central act, okay? You only had communion twice a year, sometimes three. So you only had it on Christmas and Easter. And every Sunday, the main event was the sermon, which often went for an hour to an hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> Consider how lucky you are. <laughs> so at this particular period, everybody was trying to accent the pulpit. You know, you really wanted to make the pulpit prominent. 
And so a lot of churches were building it up over the altar, getting as high as they possibly could. And Robert Smith got this idea. He said, well, what if we just put the altar on the east end and we'll put the pulpit and reading desk on the west end? And everybody's got box pews, as you can see, which they still have. And we can talk about box pews if you want to. Uh, I mean, a lot of people have a lot of delusions about box pews. Uh, you know, some people say, oh, they had box pews because they wanted to keep the warmth in. They put a brick <laughs> in it. Uh, or they wanted to have protection from the Indians. You know, I, you couldn't believe how stories I've heard. No, uh, box pews, both in England and America, were designed because it clearly defined whose space it was. All right? You paid for that pew, and it had a door on it so you could decide who could come in. Uh, that was the evolution of it. But here, it was really interesting, and I'm going to, I'll get back to the main thrust in just a second. But I was rector of St. Peter's uh, for seven wonderful years, and what always delighted me is people would come in, and you know Episcopalians, Episcopalian walks into a church, and they immediately say, I'm going to sit as far away from the altar as I possibly can. <laughs> so inevitably, you know, the first five or six pews in the church are empty. So people would come in to St. Peter's, and they'd look, and they'd see the altar, and they say, I'm going to sit as far back as I can. What they didn't know is the service started from here. <laughs> so they ended up being in the front row. <laughs> Anyway, St. Peter's was founded in 1761. It was the United Parishes of Christ Church in St. Peter's. Now, here are the two main characters we're going to be dealing with. <laughs> this is Samuel Seabury. This is William White. And we're going to take a brief look at both of them in their early history. Now, William White went to work at the United Churches of Christ Church in St. Peter's as an associate. Uh, the rector at that time was Jacob Duché, rector of the United Parishes from 1774 to 1777. Uh, and he had two assistants, William White being one of them, Thomas Combs being the other one. Now, of course, this is a absolutely volatile time in Philadelphia. There are a lot of fiery ideas that are going around, and people are talking a lot of treason. Uh, so the Second Continental Congress, which met in another of uh, Robert's buildings, Carpenter Hall, they were meeting and they invited Jacob Duche to come and say a prayer at the beginning of the service. And Jacob Duche was thrilled. So he went there and he preached one saber rattling sermon. Or, you know, he just laid it out. Definitely pro. Uh, rebellion, uh, we've got to get these Brits off our back. You know, it was a real saber rattle. And he got very positive response from it. You know, everybody was really pleased about it. They invited him to come back and do it again. Okay, the problem is, so he preaches this thing, he's identified with the cause, and then the British occupy Philadelphia in 1777. Uh, Washington, of course, retreats to Valley Forge. Uh, William White, the associate, he is moved to Maryland temporarily, not because he's escaping the British, but he just <coughs> happened to be out of town. Duché, because the British know about his saber-rattling prayer, they arrest him. And they put him into jail for one night. And after that incarceration, they convince him to write a letter to his friend George Washington, telling George Washington to give it up. It's a lost cause. He goes on and on about how this is a terrible idea. We should stop this rebellion, and we should allow the British to take back over the country. Well, what do you think Washington does when he gets it? He copies it, sends it to the newspaper and Congress. All right? So Washington sends a letter to Congress, circulating the press. <laughs> Duché knows his name is Mud. <laughs> and so he immediately gets on a boat and he sails for England. 
in 1777. Do you, do you think it was part of his get out of jail that he had to write that letter? Uh, yes. Yes. Very yes. Right. I think, yeah. and he really wanted to get out of jail. <laughs> uh, it was really funny when I was researching this lecture a long, long time ago, uh, when I was teaching church history at General Seminary in New York, and I was up in the library and I was looking for a copy. I'd heard that there was a copy of Jacob Duchesne's sermons, and so I found it uh, way back in the stacks, uh, falling apart. And it had an inscription in the inside. Somebody had written in the leaf because they wanted you to know who Duché was. And they said, Duché was a very popular preacher. He had a fine voice and a forceful delivery, but was never rated high in point of ability. His sermons were deemed flowery and flimsy. After being an American Whig, he became a loyalist. He was weak and vain, yet probably not a bad man. His habit, at least, were pious, and with the exception of his political vacillations, his conduct exemplary. <laughs> well, so anyway, Duché immediately says, I got to get out of here. And he sails to England where he spends the rest of his life. Um, and after the Brits had left uh, Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania General Assembly uh, declared him a traitor. And they, and they confiscated his property in 1778. Now, he had two assistants, as I mentioned. He had William White and Thomas Combs. Uh, Thomas Combs had loyalist tendencies, too. And when he saw his boss get on the boat, he was very quick to follow him. And he went back to England as well. Uh, White, on the other hand, uh, was, uh, was made of a little sterner stuff. Uh, he became the rector of the United Parishes uh, because there was no one else left in town. Uh, and he became chaplain to Congress and to the Continental Army. Uh, he, uh, uh, I love this, when, when they went to him, I'm just trying to give you a glimpse of this man's character, but when they went to him to tell him that Duché and Combs had both left and would he assume the rectorship of the United Parishes, uh, he said, if ever, at the desire of the vestry and members in general of these churches, and with permission of the civil authorities, the former rector, Duché, should return to this country. I shall esteem it my duty, and it will be my pleasure to resign. <laughs> That's the kind of character we're dealing with. <clears throat> okay, so now we turn to the other guy, the Reverend Samuel Seabury. He graduated from Yale, he read theology with his father, he was an Anglican priest, and then he studied medicine at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he served congregations in Westchester County from 1766 to 1775. And in 1774, he anonymously published Free Thoughts on the Proceedings of the Continental Congress, held in Philadelphia in 1774. Uh, and he published it anonymously, anonymously because it was a blatant attack on the spirit of the revolution and it earned him the ire of no less a character than Alexander Hamilton. In November of 1775, some ruffians from New Haven came down, kidnapped him, or took him to New Haven, incarcerated him, and paraded him around the town, even though he kept protesting, I didn't write that. I didn't write that. Uh, but he stayed there for about a week, and then they let him go, and he fled back uh, to his parish. Now, if this sounds familiar, some of you may have seen Hamilton, right? Yes. And Hamilton, I tried, I tried my best, but my computer skills are just not up to it, uh, because I found, of course, a copy of the performance uh, where he's actually singing. And I didn't give you the whole song, but you can get a gist of it. Hear ye, hear ye, my name is Samuel Seabury, and I present free thoughts on the proceedings of the Continental Congress. Heed not the rabble who scream revolution. They have not your interest at heart. And then, of course, Hamilton says, oh, my God, tear this dude apart. <laughs> Chaos and bloodshed are not a solution. Don't let them lead you astray. This con Congress does not speak for me. Um, <clears throat> So, what did he do? Well, wait a minute, missed it. 
Okay, after the declaration of war, Seabury ceases to lead services. Now, the reason he stopped saying services was that there was a mandate uh, from Congress that no parish would continue to pray for the king. All right? So that had to be axed. And Seabury didn't want to do that. But he didn't really have the courage, so to speak, to tell anybody that, so he just stopped doing services. <laughs> uh, New York, of course, was occupied by the British, and Washington retreated to Knightsbridge Heights, which was, was in Seabury's parish. He had a very large parish with two or three churches. So he flees behind British lines in New York, where he spends the rest of the war. He only leaves the safety of the British lines to serve as a guide to General Howe in their raids of Westchester County. Wow. Uh, he is a committed and convicted loyalist. So now we get to the end of the war and the state of the church. Well, following the war, the Anglican church is in total disarray. But some colonies, of course, are better off than others. Now, there was an organization, which I'm sure you have heard of, or, or maybe, called the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, the SPG. Uh, it was founded in New England uh, to serve New England in the mid-17th century, but it really had its main foundation in 1701 through the work of a wonderful English priest named the Reverend Thomas Bray. And the SPG was largely designed to take in a lot of money and then support missionary activity uh, around the British Empire, primarily in the colonies. So that a great many priests in the colonies, their salary was paid by the SPG <laughs> and all their equipment was provided by the SPG. So when the war finally concluded, the SPG, being a British institution organization, withdrew all of its support. So it meant that salaries just dried up, uh, that various other forms of, of ecclesiastical support were just gone. So the church was left on a very rocky, um, you know, economic footing. Well, I'm just wondering, um, SPG being um, a loyalist organization, would that not have impact on why the, the priests were loyalists? Uh, yes, the SPG, you know, educated, supported, and paid the price. When, when the war finally turned, that's a main reason why a number of those priests went back to England. Or the other option, Canada. <laughs> uh, in fact, that's where Seabury was headed. Uh, established churches, and by that I mean churches that were in, um, that were established as part of the colonial government, like in Virginia, or South Carolina, or North Carolina, or Georgia, those churches obviously suffered the most because they were clearly identified with the royalist cause. And so they, uh, they had a great deal of difficulty uh, dealing with a populace who was celebrating over the demise of British rule. Uh, and so they got hit even harder. This, by the way, is a picture of Trinity Church Wall Street. Um, the, the, so they suffered the most, but the Anglican churches in Connecticut and Pennsylvania were in better shape. Uh, Pennsylvania, because it, of course, had grown up in a environment where there were any number of churches. You know, there was a Roman Catholic church, there were uh, Quakers, you know, there were Methodists. Uh, so there, were, there was a lot of religious variety. And so the church wasn't as tied to the government. And of course, Philadelphia had been the very center of the rebellion. So they were in, in much better shape. Uh, but there was no unifying identity. All these churches really looked at themselves as instruments of the colony. And there was no sense of an overarching organization. And that, of course, was the greatest need. And there were two major problems with that. They needed, of course, an institutional structure, some kind of ecclesiastical polity 
that would enable the, these diverse colonial Anglican churches to unite and serve together. That's misprint on my part, serve together, not service together. Um, but so they needed some kind of structure. And there was a lot of questions about what kind of structure that was going to be. Uh, and of course, they needed Episcopal leadership. Uh, the colonies had, and I won't bore you with the details, but over the course of the past 80, 90 years, they had appealed to the English church, uh, the, to the Anglican authorities, to give them a bishop. Uh, but the church always refused, and technically, they were under the jurisdiction of the Bishop of London. Uh, and then they had various, each colony often had a representative uh, for the church, often not a, a clergy, could be a lay person, and different colonies did it different ways and gave them different titles. Uh, but they were sort of the ecclesiastical representative for that diocese. Uh, so they needed Episcopal leadership. They needed bishops. Now, this I write down here. You got, I, I'm sure most of you know this, you got to have three bishops to make a bishop. <laughs> All right, right, right. Bishops can't just self promote. Right. Right. <laughs> so you need three. So the challenge wasn't just to get one, it was to get three bishops. And even with the ordained clergy, you know, it was hard. Combs, White, Seabury were all born in the United States. Well, they couldn't get ordained in the United States. You need a bishop to ordain you. So they would have to take a very perilous and challenging sea voyage to go over to England to find a bishop that could ordain them, and then they'd have to come back. And they all did that. So it was a very desperate need to get some bishops on this side of, uh, of the Atlantic. That, by the way, is the case for the mitre of Samuel Seabury. So, one of the first persons to give thought to what that unified structure might be was our friend William White. Uh, William White produced in 1782 uh, a document called The Case of the Episcopal Churches in the United States of America, where he began to ask some organizational questions about how the various colonial churches might come together uh, in a unified and effective uh, organization. Uh, and spurred by that, there were numerous conferences and gatherings following over the next couple of years with various colonies participating. Some colonies would get their nose out of joint and wouldn't participate, uh, but White kept pushing them. He was absolutely tireless <clears throat> and indefatigable in working with the clergy and the laity of all the colonies to try to craft a model for a national and diocesan governance. <coughs> now, Samuel Seabury, okay, after the war, Samuel Seabury is initially thinking that he's going to go with most of his relatives and get on a ship and go to Canada. Uh, but he hears that the church in Connecticut is going to elect a bishop. Now, Folks, I don't know how to explain this to you. I mean, you're just going to have to figure it out. He goes to the Diocese of Connecticut. Now, I did find one piece to this puzzle. Uh, Ann and I were having lunch a number of years ago uh, here in Naples, and it was with a couple who lived near us in Maine, but they, they were from Connecticut. His name was Griswold, a great old Connecticut name. And he told me the story of his great-great-grandfather, who was an Episcopal priest, much loved in the Diocese of Connecticut. Uh, and he said that he was the first choice of the clergy of Connecticut. And that has been, there was, I knew there had been somebody that the clergy preferred, but he wouldn't do it. And in this case, this descendant told me the reason he wouldn't do it is he had six kids. And that he didn't want to make that dangerous voyage and go over there. He was fine and happy, had everything he needed. So that left it open. And why they choose Seabury, a renowned loyalist? This is Connecticut. They fought well and hard in the war. They did it. 
they choose Seabury. And Seabury sails to London. Uh, but of course, the British bishops refused to consecrate it uh, because, you know, we just fought a war with you and you can't take the vow to, you know, be faithful to the king. So he stuck. Well, I lived in England a long time. I know many of you have been there many times, and we all know the truth. If you want to fly up the nose of the English, you go to the Scots. <laughs> Why are you right? pointing at me? I, I, I was pointing at her, actually. <laughs> so, Seabury goes up to Scotland, where there are a group of bishops called the non-juring bishops. They're called non-juring bishops because they refuse to sign off on the Hanoverian uh, William and Mary uh, consecration at the end of the 18th century. So they refused to do that, and they were deprived of their English see, but they were able to go to Scotland and maintain jurisdiction and serve as bishops. So the non-juring Scottish bishops stepped into the breach, said, we can fly in the nose of the English, and they consecrate Seabury as bishop. And on September 25th, 1785, the first general convention of Christ Church takes place in Philadelphia, where White is able to pull together as many people as he possibly can. Um, uh, but Seabury, of course, declines to attend. He says, I'm not going to that. So now we need more bishops. We've only got one. And he's a little suspect. He's Scottish. <laughs> so the archbishop, of course, the Canterbury realizes that there's now this Scottish end run, uh, and he decides to open negotiations with White and with his compatriots. And so Pennsylvania elects White, uh, and New York elects Samuel Provost, who set sail and are consecrated bishops at Lambeth Palace on February 4th, 1787. <clears throat> and now they come back. And we've got three bishops, although it's not that easy. White and Provost have also told the Archbishop that they will not consecrate anybody until there's three bishops from the English line. <clears throat> so Seabury now realizes that he needs to compromise. And he needs to compromise, but White promised that they would obtain three bishops in England, in the English line, which took place in 1788 with the consecration of James Madison as Bishop of Virginia. Well, after a few false starts, the church finally pulls together a general convention, which reconvenes in 1789 uh, with representatives of Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. And now we get into the horse trading. Okay, the two primary traders are William White and Samuel Seabury. Now, White and Seabury have very different notions of ecclesiastical authority and Episcopal power. Seabury had promised the Scots who ordained him that he would make sure that when the Episcopal Church in the United States of America adopted a prayer book, which, you know, is so central to our identity. I mean, we don't have... Uh, you know, founding documents. We don't have uh, a Westminster Confession. We don't have, you know, uh, uh, Vatican II. We have the prayer book. The prayer book is not only how we pray, it's what we believe. And so it's enormously important. And the Scots said, okay, you will consecrate you, but we want you to promise us that when you adopt a prayer book, it'll be after ours and not theirs. <clears throat> Uh, now, there were some significant differences. Um, <laughs> there was a fellow back in the 18th century named Rattray, and he had done a lot of study in Syriac and Eastern liturgies, and, uh, and he had brought these findings back and published them in what was called the Wee Bookies. And they were read, and they were incorporated by the Scots into their Eucharistic liturgy uh, and into their prayer book. And it made it decidedly different than the English version. In fact, you know, I remember going to England for the first time in England, Scotland, 
uh, way back in the early 1970s and going to a Scottish church in Edinburgh and all of a sudden saying, whoa, this feels like home. Uh, the liturgy really was, the structure of it, a lot of the wording of it, uh, it had an epithesis. Uh, it, it was a lot more familiar because of this. Well, he was committed to the Scottish prayer book. Now, he also, though, from a polity point of view, Seabury wanted bishops in charge. He didn't want anybody messing, you know, okay, if we have a unifying organization over these colonial churches, it's going to be the bishops that are going to run things. All right? So the bishops will get together, we'll have a house of bishops, and they'll determine everything from liturgy, polity, faith, discipline. Why? Why was raised in revolutionary Philadelphia? Uh, he's a friend of Washington and the other founding fathers. Washington, you know, White is preaching back and forth at St. Peter's and at Christ Church. And wherever he goes, Washington goes. Um, and he's got he's friends of Jefferson. He's, he knows them very well. And he's been around all these conversations about how the American government was going to be structured. And so he wants a bicameral general convention with lay delegates. Enormous change. He does not want the clergy or the episcopate in charge. He wants the lay people to have a voice. Uh, so, horse trading. Seabury gets his prayer book, and White gets his bicameral legislative body. So what comes out of it is a house of bishops, and the House of Deputies, same thing we have to this day. Uh, and the House of Bishops uh, can't pass anything without the approval of the House of Deputies. House of Deputies is made up of clergy and laity. Sounds like Congress. It's, well, <laughs> Philadelphia. <laughs> he had a blueprint that everybody was talking about. <laughs> okay, I'm going to bring this to a close, and then I'll uh, answer any questions or try to that you might have. Um, William White was a beloved bishop. Uh, he lived from 1748 to 1836. Uh, so he was around for about 88 years. He founded uh, schools, uh, nursing homes, uh, hospitals. Uh, the day that he died, it was, you know, it was a citywide um, event. People just stopped working. They came out. He was, he was beloved by all. Uh, and that is his house, uh, which still is a, a, on the National Register, and you can go visit if you're in Philadelphia. Uh, here's another picture. That's his study from a couple of views. Um, when you look at the tomb, Seabury died at the age of 65 from a heart attack in 1796. And I don't want to suggest that he wasn't well loved. I think the people of Connecticut uh, liked him very much. He had moved to New London and uh, he put his roots down there and he was rector of a church, St. James Church in New London. Uh, it's interesting to note that when he died in 1796, uh, as part of his possessions, there were listed three slaves. So he was, as his father was, a slave owner. Uh, but he wrote phenomenal sermons. He was inspirational. And he eventually uh, conformed to the new dynamics of this new church. Uh, so he, uh, he deserves... Uh, our admiration on one hand, I just don't want to like it. <laughs> I, I've tried. <laughs> but both of the men have left a, a trail of wonderful institutions in their wake. So that is pretty much it. That's how it all started. And, um, and from there, it went from glory to glory. But what we're going to do, and then I'll just stop and open it to your questions, I, I didn't really know when, when <clears throat> Nicholas and I were talking and I was saying, all right, I, I just want to do uh, a session on some of my favorite 
you know, periods or events in church history. And so I thought, I was, well, I'll just choose the ones I really like. So we did the one on the Constantinian triumph and we did the one um, on um, uh, the English Reformation. And we're doing this one on the foundation of Bakusa. And next week we're doing one on the actual movement. I didn't realize at the time these things were all connected in really a wonderful way. I mean, we see how this is connected with the English Reformation, how that went on. Uh, but the Oxford movement is some, uh, a movement that occurs in the 19th century. It obviously starts in England, but then comes to America and has had an enormous impact on how we worship, uh, how, we, uh, how we practice our devotions, uh, how we relate to clergy. Uh, the Oxford movement was a, a, a powerful movement within the English church initially, and then it came over to this country, uh, and it, it truly affected uh, both the way we built churches, how we worshiped, uh, how we saw ourselves. So that will be the, uh, uh, the topic for next week. And that will be Oxford Moon, my swan song. <laughs> That'll be in a fortnight. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I keep forgetting. I got the I got the date right there. Yeah. No, it's, no, it's March. 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 Whoops. March. I didn't. <laughs> okay, we'll be here. We'll Calendar be here. challenge. We'll be here. It's the 27th of March. The 21st. 21st. <laughs> hey, Tad. I guess show up when Nicholas tells you. <laughs> He'll send me an email. <laughs> Is the Seabury, the Seabury of Seabury Western? Yes. Okay, in Evanston? Okay. Yes. Yes. Seminary? Yes. When the, when the, the uh, clergy from the United States came to get uh, uh, made bishops, what was the, re was the reaction of the archbishop? Well, he, you know, once, once he knew that there was this ability for them to get consecrated uh, by the Scottish bishops. He wanted to exert uh, his control as much as he had. So that, and, and I didn't say this, but maybe I made an assumption uh, that you would know this, but, but just as the Scottish bishops uh, said, you've got to, uh, you know, we want you to adopt our prayer book. Uh, there were a number of issues which the archbishop uh, held before White and and uh, uh, held before White that he needed to conform to. Uh, there was talk about the Athanasian Creed. There were various <coughs> creedal corrections he wanted. Uh, he wanted some prayer book revisions. Uh, so they did have expectations. They wanted to have some kind of traditional relationship uh, with the church. Uh, now, again, as far as the prayer book is concerned, uh, the English did not get what they want because that was Seabury's one playing card, and he played it well. And actually, I'm glad he did. I, you know, if you've ever gone to a uh, a true English prayer book service from 1662, it will be completely foreign to you. Uh, I mean, you you say the Lord's Prayer after communion, um, and when you see one that's done as it would have been done, uh, there's no chasuble. Uh, the servant <coughs> wears a coat. It's just, it's, it's just very odd for Americans who've been raised with this Scottish hybrid. <coughs> yes. I was going to add, what's the difference between the Scottish prayer book and the English prayer book? Anglican prayer book. There's a difference in the flow of the communion service. The, 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 uh, the English prayer book does have a very confusing uh, way in which you go to receive communion, you come back, it sort of falls in the middle of the, of the prayer of consecration in some ways. Uh, I mean, they get it consecrated, but then you go and you come back and you do a lot of stuff that we would do before we would, we would get uh, communion. Uh, there is this thing called an epiclesis, or an epiclesis, I've heard it pronounced both ways, which is that moment in the service where the celebrant calls down the Holy Spirit to be on the elements, and that is not in the English service at all. 
Uh, that's a, that came through Rattray's We Bookies and was interjected into the, the Scottish Rite. Is this the Anglican Church in Scotland? Because there would also be the, the Church of Scotland. The Church of Scotland. Right. Which well, the Presbyterian Church here. Correct. So this is the Anglican Church. In it's Scotland. the Episcopal Church in Scotland. It's the Episcopal Church in Scotland. And it is not. It is church. not the uh, the established church. Yeah, because the established church is total. Totally Correct. And so it's always something of an outlier. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Could you comment a little bit? Uh, in the larger context of the Anglican Church, and I'm going to refer particularly to Virginia and how the Anglican Church had their dominance and was supported by taxes, and the colonists were uh, that were non-Anglican were very, very upset with the Anglican Church, and there were acts of tolerance that allowed these churches to exist. But the, if I'm not mistaken, you could be tolerated. But and you needed an act of tolerance in order to be tolerated as a separate church. And can you comment a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, well, it's, 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 you, you've pretty it's much really outlined it to a certain uh, extent. I'm not sure. Um, there were a couple of, of uh, uh, uprisings uh, within Virginia, uh, especially, I believe, in uh, what would be Western Virginia uh, in the, let's see, get my geography right, in sort of the southwestern border. Um, where there were a number of, of non-Anglican uh, churches, and especially, you know, this this is a this is a time of of amazing um, religious fervor in the United States. Um, you know, George Whitefield, if you've ever heard that name, uh, George Whitefield was a charismatic and incredibly effective preacher, and he came over, and, and we were in the midst of what was called eventually the Great Awakening. Uh, and, you know, Whitefield was invited to speak. He spoke at St. Peter's and he spoke at Christ Church. Uh, but he also spoke outdoors. Uh, and, you know, the people that he converted were not necessarily Anglicans. Uh, a lot of them became Methodist or joined other, you know, Protestant organizations. And there was a lot of resentment on their part that their taxes uh, supported a... Uh, a, a a state church. Uh, and there were times when they rebelled, especially if there was a specific tax that they felt was unfair. Uh, and this gave them a reason to both uh, rebel against it and, uh, and to try to dismiss it. So yeah, that was, that was certainly true in Virginia. But it, and it, Virginia was an exception in some places. When the, in the other states, the colonies that I know about, uh, they didn't seem to have that kind of, of agitation, uh, and it may reflect the degree uh, to which the Anglican Church was not only um, not only part of the taxation scheme, but was so um, so much a part of the governing scene. It's a church and state separation in our constitution that essentially comes out of the Virginia connection between comes out church of Jefferson. and state. There's, you yeah. can separate the two. Yeah. Well, Jefferson pushed for that in Virginia as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so and when did Roger Williams, when, when was he involved with that? Before. Well, Roger Williams is, you know, in Way Rhode Island. That. I, I can speak to Roger Williams. But he was active Island. in that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Roger Williams is 1636. Roger Williams was came to Boston uh, in the early 1600s after the Winthrop fleet, and because he was a Baptist, he was little, literally driven out of Boston and settled in Providence, and then got a charter. And it was a unique charter because it had the whole separation of church and state. So Rhode Island was the only colony that didn't have a state-run church attached to the charter itself. No, that's not true. Pennsylvania. Rhode Island the charter was the first one, though, I will say that, 1636. Pennsylvania was later, I, I agree. <laughs> but that was the beginning of it. And so what happened was that all of the uh, kind of unique churches that were not part of the Episcopal Church gravitated toward Rhode Island. So you had every form of Protestantism, the first Jewish um, synagogue was formed in Newport, Rhode Island in the early 1700s. You also had the Quakers flock there. 
So that was the beginning of the whole religious freedom movement under Roger Williams. Very unique situation. I read once that the Church of Virginia, which well, it says almost a church state, does the best result of trying to take care of the poor folks in the state. They felt it was their responsibility to do something. Virginia Vestries, most historians agree, they, they were the breeding ground of a lot of the most important politicians during the revolutionary times. Um, and, and again, this is one of the, the positive elements in, uh, in the fact that there was such a uh, limited supervision of these parishes. Uh, there was no bishop. Uh, there, you know, and often the uh, uh, the rector was not interested in necessarily getting involved in, in the politics of the situation. You know, they were given a, a house in their glebe and, and uh, a, a, uh, you know, part of the tobacco harvest and they were fine. Uh, so the vestries took on a lot of, of control uh, over the parish's life and the parish's ministry. Yes. And there were, there were churches in every little burg. So a lot of the rectors preached at one church one Sunday and the next the one the next burg over the next Sunday. Mm -hmm. So the vestries had most of the responsibility for keeping those properties intact. But I mean, it's only now that a lot of those churches are truly combining and or closing. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful story about uh, Bruton Parish, which I'm sure you know of, but, uh, in Virginia, where uh, uh, the, the minister had, had become very unpopular, uh, and he had uh, uh, he had offended uh, the local squire, uh, and so the local squire uh, went out and got himself a fox uh, that he killed, and then he put it, uh, dragged it on his horse through the front doors of the church and through the, through the nave and all around. And then he waited until the uh, minister was preaching and he let go of the hounds. <laughs> I, I'm sure it's apocryphal, but it's a great story. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Are you done? Yeah. Yes. That church gave us most recently an example of the organ a builder that we subsequently have contracted with. Oh, great. Because the church itself and the design of its organ and the sound of that organ was exactly what we wanted. And it was roughly comparable in size to our church. Bruton Parish? Yeah. Uh, Bruton Parish? Yes. Wow. That's a good point to end on. That is a good point. Yeah. Go in peace, love and serve the Lord. Yeah. <laughs>